The return of totemism in childhood. On page 101, Freud quotes an anthropologist named Reinach, who gives what he calls a catechism of totemism. Now, he uses the word catechism loosely. This is a catechism, in other words, basic beliefs, basic system of beliefs of totemism, which was put together by this, by this ethnologist named Reinach. Uh, uh, this is on page 101, so I'll just read a couple of them. Number one, certain animals may neither be killed nor eaten, but individual members of the species are reared by human beings and cared for by them. So you see already, first of all, totemism is about animals. It's a proto-religion which is connected to animals. Number two, an animal which has died an accidental death is mourned over and buried with the same honors as a member of the clan. In primitive societies, people live in clans. What's a clan? A clan is a small group of people. Uh, like what we would, you know, in Hebrew we would say a, a shevet, right, a tribe. Tri tribes and clans are similar. Uh, shevet usually is more nomadic, but whatever. A clan is, a, is not a city. It's not a, definitely not as big as a country. And we're talking about a few hundred people at most. Definitely not a thousand. A thousand is not a clan anymore. A thousand is already a civilization. It's based on kinship, right? On? Kinship. Kinship, of course. Well, totemism is kinship. Very much so, yes. Kinship, in other words, relation. It's a family. So a clan, a clan the closest thing we have to a clan today is a mafia. A mafia is a good example of a clan because not everyone in a mafia is, is related by blood. Yes and no, I mean, there, it is, a, you know, la familia, right? It's la casa nostra, it's our house, our family, but there are elements of a mafia that are married into the mafia and so on. And even so, there are adopted, you know, if you know, you know the, great, the great mafia movie of all time, The Godfather. So if you've seen The Godfather, you know, for example, one of the most important characters is played by Robert Duval, who's an Irishman. He's not Italian even, but he's part of the family. He's part of the family, right? He's part of us, because we adopted him, even though he's Irish. So in, in a way, a clan also functions like that. It's not a, it is blood. It's true, blood is very, very important, but it's not just blood. It's a clan of, 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 of kinfolk. And this clan identifies with an animal, one animal. Okay, so that animal, we don't eat. If we belong to a clan, like the kangaroo clan, for example, as he gives that example here, the, in Australia, there's the clan of the kangaroo. So we don't eat kangaroo, most of the time. And if a, and, and if a kangaroo dies, if we find a dead kangaroo, we, we do a levaya, we bury it, we say kaddish, we say shiva, it's a kangaroo, a kangaroo is a kangaroo, it's not a... Stop an animal. A kangaroo is a member of the family. There was a scandal. What? There was a scandal last year that somebody from the conservatives offered that he will, even for money or I don't know, offer that he can be a Hazana to say Kaddish for a dead. Uh, for a rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> you heard about it? I heard this one, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so obviously, you know, Judaism. Uh, Judaism is, is a huge move away from totemism. Judaism wanted to move away from treating animals. We treat animals with respect, of course, but we don't say Kaddish for, for chickens. <laughs> when I eat my hamburger, I don't say Kaddish for cow, the cow that I'm eating, right? But at this point, in a very, very primitive society, not only do I say Kaddish for it, I mean, I identify with it. It doesn't mean I don't, it doesn't mean I'm a vegetarian, by the way, right? If, if I'm part of the kangaroo clan, I'm not a vegetarian. I eat everything else. I eat rabbits and cows and dogs and cats and bugs and birds and everything. I just don't eat kangaroos, generally speaking. Generally speaking. And if a kangaroo dies, I, I say cottage for it. When one of the animals which are usually spared is number four, I'm jumping. Uh, has, to, has to be killed under stress of necessity. Apologies are offered to it. And the attempt is made by means of various artifices and evasions to mitigate the violation of the taboo. That is to say, of the murder. If I'm a kangaroo clansman, then to kill a kangaroo is not the killing, it's murder. I'm guilty of murder. 
And, and sometimes though, but there is, an, there is an acknowledgement that sometimes I do have to eat a kangaroo if, I, if I'm going to die, if the clan is going to starve, so, and, the, and kangaroos are the only thing available, they will eat a kangaroo. But they will apologize and they will, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this because it's part of my, it's a clansman. When the animal is made the victim of a ritual sacrifice, it is solemnly bewailed. So here's a funny thing. On the one hand, I don't eat kangaroo, but every once in a while, we all eat a kangaroo together. We have a special chag, the high, the yamim noraim of the kangaroo, and we all sit, we all capture a few kangaroos, and we, we sacrifice them in a special way with a lot of honor, and we eat them together in a very ceremonious way. Not, we don't eat it, uh, we don't eat it because we're hungry. We eat it because it's a sacred, holy sacrifice. It's a korban, the kangaroo. And we only do it once a year. That's generally the rule, is a, a totem, when it is eaten, is eaten only once a year. And a very, very, it's a very, very holy uh, festival, uh, festive meal. And on this occasion, number six, you see, on particular solemn occasions and at religious ceremonies, the skins of certain animals are worn. So I will, not only will I sacrifice the kangaroo, but I will skin it and I will put its skin on my body and I will wear the skin of the kangaroo. We know, of course, I'm sure we've all seen movies where you have Africa, where you know the chief is wearing a leopard or a lion skin or whatever. Um, we, when we first see these things, it's not clear why, why are they doing that? Is that just, Fashion? When I, when I capture a leopard and wear a leopard, is it just, uh, wow, it looks so chic. You know, it's the latest fashion in Paris, you know, to wear leopard skin. Uh, for Westerners, yeah, but for, for primitive people, no, it's not fashion. When you wear the skin of an animal, it means that you are the animal. I become the, this animal. That's why I want to wear its skin. That's why its skin is precious to me, because I identify with, with the animal. Uh, clans and individuals adopt the names of animals, for example, uh, namely of the, of the totem animal. So if I belong to the leopard tribe, I, I am a leopard. I'm not Michael Kegel, I'm Michael Leopard. We all are. We all call ourselves the leopard tribe. Number 12, the members of the totemic clan often believe that they are related to the totem animal by the bond of a common ancestry. So if I belong to the leopard clan, it means that I believe that I descend from a leopard. How is it that I don't look like a leopard? I look like a human being? Okay, that's, that's not such a big issue. For us, it's a big issue. For us, we're very scientific. Oh, come on, don't be stupid. You're not a leopard. You look like a leopard. You look like a human being. You're a different animal altogether. For a, pr a primitive human being, that, they don't think that way. They don't, they don't think in such clear black and white terminology. They, for them, a, a human and an animal is not that different. Nothing, nothing is really that different. They're, the world of a primitive, just like the world of children. For a child, if a child says, I'm a dog, you know, ruff, ruff. you see, but you know you're not a dog. Come on, you know you're not a dog. No, I'm a dog. Ruff, 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 ruff. I'm a dog, right? So the child, now what does the child think? He's not a dog? The, the child doesn't make a scientific distinction between homo sapiens and dog. I am a dog. That's who I am. Right today, I'm a dog. Especially if I say I have a dog and I, I play with dogs all, with my dog all the time, and my dog is my biggest source of comfort in my life. So I'm a dog. I'm a dog with a human body. But that's just you know, it's a, it's just an accident of nature that I have a human body. I'm really a dog. Because you know, a, a, a mind, a simple primitive mind, has a beautiful poetic magical way of thinking that we've lost. We're, we're very suspicious of magic. Uh, we think of magic as infantile, as childish. It's true, it is infantile and childish, but it's also a way of thinking that uh, is in some ways is more powerful than our own because you can connect with, with deeper realities as it were. By the way, what does it mean when I, if I say that I'm a dog or a cat? Well, clearly, I'm, I'm not a, I'm a homo sapien, I'm not, but that identification means that on some level, there's something about 
a dog that resonates with me. There's um, which it, to go back to this idea of, of heraldic animals when when we say Yehuda is a lion we know Yehuda was not a lion everybody knows Yehuda was not a lion well, so why is Yehuda a lion all of a sudden what, what makes him a lion there's something about the animal that is a lion something about that animal some power some force some magical secret that is similar to Yehuda what is that power? So, you know, anybody who has watched uh, The Lion King with their children, you know, Walt Disney, it's very obvious the lion is the king of the jungle. We always say that. If you go to Africa today and you, you interview a lion, excuse me, sir, are you the king of the jungle? You know, the, the lion is not aware that he's the king of the jungle. But from our perspective, when we look at the animal kingdom, when we go to the zoo, we, we, we talk to our children about animals, we say, wow, that's a lion. You see the lion? That's the king of the jungle. What do you mean the king? Why is it the king of the jungle? The king of the jungle means nobody can touch it. Nobody can hurt the lion, not even an elephant. An elephant, maybe an elephant should be the king of the jungle. Maybe a buffalo. Those are powerful animals, gigantic, powerful animals. No. Why? Because a buffalo will never rush, run after a lion and kill it. He'll defend himself against the lion, but he's not going to hunt a lion because a buffalo doesn't eat lions. But a lion will hunt a buffalo when he's hungry, especially with a, if he gets a couple of his friends, they'll hunt a buffalo and they will kill the buffalo. And nothing, a lion is afraid ultimately of nothing, and therefore a lion is a king. Likewise, an eagle. An eagle is the king of birds. What kind of bird would attack an eagle? Yeah, you have to be a crazy bird to attack an eagle. But an eagle will attack other birds and eat them. So... And then there's other birds. For example, we mentioned a crow. A crow is known to... Uh, why would somebody... If I could be an eagle, why would I be a crow? Well, because we know that crows are very in intelligent birds. They're smart. They're smarter than eagles. So if you feel that your energy... For example, if I, if I don't feel like I'm a big, strong guy, but I feel like I'm pretty smart. I feel like I could beat somebody, I, I could de defeat a big strong guy in a battle with my intelligence rather than my strength. So I will say, no, no, I'm not an eagle, I'm a crow. I'm gonna kill him my own way. I'm not gonna jump on him like an eagle. I'm gonna be a little sneaky. Most animals are predators. Are predators, yeah, yeah. Yeah, most, yeah, but even, you know, you could, even a, an animal that's not a predator has certain powers that are admirable. Um, for example, an, uh, uh, an ant. An ant is not a very powerful animal, but it's, it's amazing. It's this, the social, political complexity of an ant hill. It's quite amazing. So if you think of yourself as a politician, for example, if you say, I'm a great politician, so maybe an ant is a good herald, a heraldic animal. Well, that we know, but, but people in, in primitive cultures do. Some people do. Some people will, will choose a mouse. Uh, not choose. What does that mean, choose? It means that at some point in there, in some point in this prehistoric world, one of these primitive human beings was, was a genius of some sort. And this genius saw a rat doing something and suddenly felt, oh, that's me. I'm just like that rat. What he did now, the way he, the way he captured or, or, or ran away or did something, that's my energy. So I'm, I am the rat. And, he's, you know, and he, becomes, he identifies as the rat. And then he teaches his children the way of the rat. Right? How, how does one become a success? Because after all, every species of animal that is, extinct, that is, that is extant, that is around must have some power if it, if it exists. We might say, well, a, a mouse is not as strong as a lion. That's true, but there's mice everywhere. The mice didn't go, mice didn't go extinct. For, for example, a panda is a very bad totem because clearly a panda is not a successful animal. He's going extinct. You know, maybe in a few more years, there'll be no more pandas. That's a bad totem. 
But a little, a little bug, a little mosquito, a mosquito is a very good totem. There's, no, there's very little chance of mosquitoes going extinct. So if you want to identify with the power, a real power in nature, a mosquito is a very good totem. Why not? It just depends on, on the way you psychologically, personally resonate with this animal. And then, as the pater familias of, you know, of your clan, you give all your children and your clansmen this identity of the mosquito. We're the mosquito clan. And, and, and you teach them, whatever primitive form of Torah you have, what it means to be a, a, a mosquito man. There are gobs in the Middle East. Where a gob, a gob is what is it? It's, a, it's not a bug animal, but it's, you know, it can be very positive. Uh, you're a good hearted, you're, it's a symbol of freedom, you are for freedom. Um, you know, like in Israel, it's, it's on the left. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When you're when you're you're a dove or a hawk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So some people are proud of being a dove. That in Christianity, obviously, the dove has become a very important symbol of Jesus, right? Yeah. The, in Christianity, the fish, another one, a very important uh, uh, group of animals that became totems is, is sea animals, fish. They're different um, totemic clans that that took on certain fish as their animal salmon or whatever so the fish the dove these are powerful totems it doesn't always we we tend to jump to a lion wolf you know vi, uh, eagle lion wolf eagle those are the big three right is there another one of uh, those are the most popular in western culture you know want to be the boss i'm a lion a wolf or an eagle uh, but there's so many different animals depending on what emotional resonance you want the, 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 the tribe ha has with this animal. So these primitive tribes then have these, uh, when, when they identify with an animal, with a spirit animal or an energy of an animal, so that's their ancestor, it's their family member, they don't eat it because you don't eat your brothers, right? It's, for, for them it would be, it'd be just as, it'd be cannibalism, li literally. Because some, some of these tribes, by the way, they are cannibalistic, right? Cannibalism is practiced at this time. So it would be, for example, this is literally, uh, he, he brings it up at, in at one point. It would be much worse, if, I, if I'm a kangaroo, and somebody, some, somebody else in the room is, uh, is uh, emu, it, it would be a much worse crime for me to hunt and to kill an, a kangaroo animal than to eat, to hunt and eat another human being who's an emu. Because if I eat a, a, a kangaroo animal, that's cannibalism. That's murder and cannibalism. If I kill a, a homo sapien human being who belongs to the clan of emu, that's killing, it's not nice, but it's not murder. And it's not cannibalism. Even though he, we would say that you're eating a human. Technically speaking, he's human, but not really. He's not really human, he's an emu. Right, so the, the, the clan identity is, 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 is the most important identity. Uh, now just to read here, now this is now on page 103, he gives Fraser's description of what a, a totem is. Fraser says, a totem is a class of material objects which a savage regards with superstitious respect, believing that there exists between him and every member of the class an intimate and altogether special relation. The connection between a man and his totem is mutually beneficent, the totem protects the man, and the man shows his respect for the totem in various ways by not killing it. Um, if it be an animal, not cutting it <clears throat> or gathering it if it's a plant. So it, a totem can also be a plant. As distinguished from fetish, a totem is never an isolated individual, but always a class of objects, generally a species. A fetish might be a specific object. I might pick up a, a rock or a tree, and I might feel that, you know, I, you know, I'm a savage and I see this, wow, this beautiful pink thing, and I pick it up and I say, oh, this is magical power, and I'm always gonna, I'm gonna put it under my pillow, and I'm always gonna be with me, it's always gonna be with me because it gives me power. That's a fetish, we call. Uh, a fetish in the original sense of the word. But a totem is not a fetish because it's not this thing, it's a class, it's a species. The whole species as a whole is my, is my totem. 
which is of course why I can sometimes kill and eat one in a ritual sacrifice. If I eat a kangaroo once a year, I'm not going to destroy the kangaroo species because I identify not with this kangaroo, but with kangaroo as a whole. The clan totem is reverenced by a body of men and women who call themselves by the name of the totem, believe themselves to be of one blood, descendants of a common ancestor, and bound together by common obligation to each other. Totemism is thus both a religious and social system. In its religious aspect, it consists of the, religious, of the relations of mutual respect and protection between a man and his totem. In its social aspect, it consists of the relations of the clansmen with each other and men of other clans. The first distinction you can, we can make in totemism is the relationship that I, as a member of the kangaroo clan, have to the kangaroo. And on the other hand, there's a relationship that I have to other kangaroos in my clan. Lahavdil, Allafe Havdalois, as we say, to compare to the Torah, the Torah also has a very, very similar distinction. In the, in the Torah, we have mitzvot. We have 613 mitzvot, which are divided into chukim and mishpatim. We've discussed this in our other classes, I think we did on Tehman Khan, right? Uh, the, the Torah is divided. There are different ways to divide. Right. There's also negative and positive mitzvahs, do and don't do. But chukim and mishpatim are two general types of mitzvahs. Chukim are mitzvot b'nei adam lemakom, between, uh, ben adam lemakom, from between a human being and God. And then, then there's ben adam lechavero, mitzvot which are between myself and fellow human beings, so those, those are called mishpatim. Which is why even today we when you use the word mishpat, mishpat uh, mishpatim are laws in the most simple sense of the word, like a bit today, a bit mishpat is a a courthouse, uh, because in the courthouse we have human, we deal with human social issues among each other. And then there's the whole other field, which, you know, it, it's funny, in, in, um, since the uh, since, um, Haskalah and, and, and Jewish emancipation, even up until today, for example, uh, we speak about religious Jews and non-religious Jews, right? Chilonim uh, and Tatim, right? And what we mean by that, it's, funny, it's a very funny thing. When we say religious Jews, what we mean is Jews who are very concerned with chukim. That's what we mean. When we say non-religious Jews, we say, oh, well, they, in other words, what's chukim? Chukim is tefillin, kashrut, shabbat, chagim, and things like that. Things that are not between the human beings, right? Things that don't make sense logically. They have no rationale behind them, right? It's between myself and God. So we say, oh, he's a dati, he's a religious man. Why? Because he puts on filling, he eats kosher, he does all that stuff between him and God, right? This other person, no, he's not religious, he's a secular person. But does he murder? No, no he's a good person, he doesn't murder. Does he steal? No, he doesn't steal. So he does a lot of mishpatim. <laughs> he's not. So why are you calling him secular? In, modern, in the modern world, we, we, because we made that division, so religious is associated with one, one and the other with the other. But it's, it's unfortunate. And of course we know, it's, what the, the really sad thing is that there's a lot of Jews which, are, which call themselves chilonim. They say, I'm a secular Jew, I don't believe in God, I don't keep Shabbat. But the person is a good person. And then you have people who are datim, very religious, but he's a jerk. He's an asshole. <laughs> he's a jerk, he's a thief, he's a, he beats up his children, he steals, he's a, he's a horrible person. So why is this person religious? He, all the mishpatim he, he destroys, he, he has tefillin, he wears a black hat. But he's a horrible person. So why are you saying he's religious and he's not? From the standpoint of the Torah, maybe he's more religious, he, but he doesn't believe in God. Okay, but he's more religious. Because he, he does mitzvot, which he does, the, the, he's more careful about the mishpatim than about the chukim, right? It, what I'm saying is that this is, this is a modern uh, confusion that resulted of the Haska, uh, from the Haskalah and from assimilation. Is that we don't longer appreciate that the Torah would never make such a distinction as Dati and Chiloni. Dati and Chiloni doesn't make any sense from the standpoint of the Torah. Except that it's true, one, one group is more concerned with these mitzvot and another one with these mitzvot. Why? Because the, because as we see here, right, in, in, as he's saying, in, in these early totemistic 
cultures, there's also a distinction between how I behave towards fellow human beings and how I behave towards my totem. There is that logical, natural distinction. And all human cultures will have that type of distinction, more or less. You had a question? No, just, um, I mean, it's a question in criminology. That, yeah. Like, most, most secular people don't commit murders, um, not because they are afraid of being persecuted and getting jailed and, and uh, having their lives ruined, but because inside their minds they have some, you know, um, moral convictions which come from, where is that? They come from, from religion, from some moral teachings of their religion, of the religion, of the teachings of their society. I don't steal in the shop because, you know, it's in the criminal code that I'm not supposed to steal in the shop. So th this this is exactly exactly this is why it's not so useful to 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 to, to make a distinction between religious and non-religious because all in in a sense all taboos are religious originally all of them um, so it's a bit artificial to say that the taboo against stealing from a store is not religious it it's true that we don't you know, in, in secular law, you don't always talk, you don't talk about God. You don't need to bring God into a law book. However, when you're looking at the history of the law, the history will always be religious. It's always bound up with a sense of what we would call religion. Uh, but, in other, you see, in other words, even the word religious is a very recent word. The way we understand religious as something distinct from non-religious. In ancient societies, whatever societies we're talking about, whether it's Jewish or non-Jewish, there was no distinction between... If you, if you look at Roman law, for example, in the Roman legal system, there's no, there's no such thing as a, something that is not connected to the gods. Everything's connected to the gods. So, so all of this stuff is we, in our modern so-called secular and like world, we have forgotten the history of it, and we, don't, we no longer use the language of God. But the reality of God is still there. We just don't use the language of it. Sam, you're going to say? Because I don't know how to put belief in cosmology just is irrelevant then. Like, why cosmology? Why? Why do you mean by that? My thinking is even if uh, taking the Torah in abstraction, uh, the hypothetical, you know, uh, moral atheist and immoral religion. Is said you are theoretically equal in religiosity, um, and you can say sure that uh, the uh, moral atheist uh, moral code has its origins in religion. There, there is a lot of the times an explicit, it's a rejection of the, the basis of of the idea. Or, I don't know. I don't think it's. What do you think? We have an example. Um, Someone who uh, so. I take a, I don't know, maybe he's not a nice person, but pretend Richard Dawkins, for example, is a okay. very good person. Yeah. Right, you know, uh, hypothetically, you know, it's someone who's explicitly opposed to the idea you know, of being in God. Are we to say he's equally religious under this idea? Well, I don't know him personally, but, but it, 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 we even, in a very loose way, we speak of values that we hold sacred. Even the most secular person will, will, will say, look, there are certain things I just, I wouldn't do. Certain things are just too, they're too sacred. I, I, you know, uh, human life for me is sacred. Uh, uh, property is sacred, whatever, whatever values. Now, when you use the word sacred, the person who uses that word will say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. I just, it's just sacred. But, okay, that's very nice. But what do you really say? What do you? What is the person saying when they're saying it's sacred, but I don't believe in God? Okay, so theologically speaking, at the level of very, very hyper mathematical consciousness, you don't believe in God. Fine, but that's not what religion is anyway. That's not what real, historically speaking, when we're talking about religion, we're talking about pe human beings' commitment 
to certain values. So if something is a value for you, that's God, effectively speaking. You don't want to call it God for whatever reason because you know you fancy yourself, I read so much Spinoza, Nietzsche, so I don't want to call it God. But you behave like a religious person. Because if you, if you weren't a religious person, um, just a simple, um, you know, you know this, the great movie that came out recently about the origins of uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, uh, the sea, or whatever, something with the word sea in it. it the, the original story that Moby Dick is based on is about these sailors who are out, they're out, they're stuck out in the middle of the, of the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of nowhere, they know, they're in a little lifeboat, the, the ship has been sunk by a, by a sperm whale, and they know they're going to be, they're probably not going to survive. If they're, maybe they will if they're lucky. And at one point, there are, in a, one of, there are about four or five guys in a small boat. And one of them dies from starvation, from whatever. So, they say, so the other ones are like, okay, let's, let's throw him over. Let's throw him into the water. And the captain says, a good sailor doesn't waste what he might need one day. And all of the other ones look at him and they realize what he's saying. And, and, and of course, what happens is that uh, a few weeks later, they do eat him. They, eat, they, kept, the, they kept the body and they ate him. Um, now, it, it's amazing. You have people who are on... They're going to die. They have nothing, there's no hope anymore. Why do they have any scruples about eating another human being? What is that? Why would you have any scruples about that? Obviously, it's food. Another human being is food. I'm, I need to eat, right? And yet, part of my hardwired consciousness is that I can't do this. This is wrong. What is it? Why? Why is that wrong? That's a taboo. A taboo against cannibalism means you are religious. And the fact that you don't call it religious, that's nothing. That's just, you just don't understand what religion means. But, but practically, historically speaking, any taboo that you have, whatever that is, means you're religious. It means you have a value that something is just too sacred. It's too much for me to do. I will not do that. That shows you're religious. Because naturally, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. An animal, you know, if, if a group of dogs are hungry and one dog is dead, they'll eat them. It's, they'll, they don't even think about it. What's, what's, the, what's the issue? Okay, so we have, we have uh, uh, rules which, more in a more narrow sense, put us in a relationship directly with the totem, or as we say, you know, the chukim in the Torah, the havdil. And on the other hand, we have social uh, rules, which are social taboos. Most important of all then, is, is this taboo of exogamy. I'll jump now to page 105. Uh, this is the second paragraph from the bottom. The members of a totem clan are brothers and sisters and are bound to help and protect one another. We're all brothers and sisters in the clan. Even with my father, I'm a brother. With my mother, I'm a sister, right? Because why? Because we're all kangaroos. If a member of a clan is killed by someone outside it, the whole clan of the aggressor is responsible for the deed and the whole clan of the mur murdered man is at one in demanding the satisfaction of the, of the blood that has been shed. So here we have the most basic f feud between clans. In, a, in the Torah, it survives because of a much more ancient institution, uh, Goel Damim, right? That when, if somebody kills my brother, I go kill him. I have an obligation, he's my brother. I don't wait for the law to take him to court. I go kill him personally. And if I can't kill him, I'll kill his brother. I have, I have to get some blood vengeance, right? That, that's what he's describing here, that in my, my clan, if somebody in my clan is hurt by somebody in their clan, I have a religious obligation to go kill someone in their clan. In, the, in their clan. It's not a personal, I might not want to, I, I, maybe I'm scared, I don't want to go kill them, they're, they're very strong people. Doesn't matter, you have a religious obligation. They, they killed your brother, now you have to go kill one of, one of them. Sorry? No, he, he, he's saying that, they, that, uh, that in, in, in totemism, 
I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 Torah, no, 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 no. In the Torah, we have, uh, yeah, yeah. No, in the Torah. The, yeah, no, but I'm talking about Goel Damim. A Goel, a Goel Damim is in the Torah. Oh, uh, well, by the, by, by the talk, when it talks about the Are Miklat. Whenever it talks about an Ir Miklat, so it's, it's to protect, an Ir Miklat is specifically to protect a, um, to protect an, an accidental murder against a Goel Damim. In other words, you know, if I, if I kill somebody, you know, I, I'm, I'm in this forest and I'm axing and this flies out of my head and it kills him, so I'm, I'm innocent. I didn't, I didn't do it on purpose. I, I, it was an accident, a pure accident. But now his brother is going to want to kill me. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, in, in the Torah. Also has to go to the... No, no, no. Only no. The ir miklat is that if I kill somebody by accident, so now my life is in danger from a goel damin. But the Torah wants to protect me. Because the, the Torah understands that Goel Damim, he's right in a way, but he's not really right. And the Torah always wants to put justice, real mishpat, above everything. So it says, look, he, this guy's in danger because, why? Because at that, in, that, in the world of the Torah, in the world of back then, a Goel Damim was a standard procedure. Everybody, has, everybody who, who's a murderer gets killed. It was an accident. I don't care if it's an accident. What does that, what does that have to do with, with me that it's an accident? I have to kill you. You killed my brother. I have to kill you, right? So the Torah says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> an accident? There's such a thing as an accident. So what happens? So, the, so in the Torah it says you have to have three aremiklat inside and three outside. How long do you have to stay in the So you run to the aremiklat and you're protected, right? You have to stay there until the Kohen Gadol dies. <laughs> <laughs> Which becomes a whole, there's a whole other funny thing about that, but we won't get into that. Yeah, but at least, at least there was such a thing as, a, as being protected from blood vengeance. Which, which, was, which was very important to have that uh, uh, option. In a world like, you know, the Arab world, um, and I don't mean Arab today, I mean Arab pre-Islam. Today, also today, also today. But the, the, the uh, vengeance rule is very, very ancient, much older than Islam, you know, older than Judaism also. It's before Moshe Rabbeinu. It's a very ancient law. But in, that's, but in, in, the, in the Arab world, it, it, you see it even today. It's still, uh, it's still practiced uh, to some extent. It, because it's an ancient, it's a very primitive form of law. What is it? It's law, really, right? It's law, law which is not yet uh, aware of humanity as a category. We think in terms of human and less than human or whatever. We say, uh, even if I say, oh, he's a Palestinian. Oh, he's a Palestinian, but he's still a human being. I can't do everything I want with a Palestinian. And vice versa, right? Even my enemy is a human. Even a Nazi, when, when in 1945, when they set up the, the, in Nuremberg, the courts in Nuremberg, they said, look, there, these, these are horrible people, yes, but we're going to put them on trial like human beings. Now, that category of human is a, is a late category. And here, in totemism, it doesn't exist yet. There's no human. There's kangaroos, there's emus, there's lions, there's bears. There's no human. So, so if he kills me and I'm a kangaroo, I'm, I'm the only human. He's not human. I can kill him. It's not murder. Right? It's not murder. It's a different way of thinking. He's not my family. Like I say, the, the, only, the, the similar mentality today is a mafia. If I, if I belong to, to my mafia and somebody kills me, so that's it. I, I, can go, I have to go kill him. It's a, it's a chiyuv. I have to go kill somebody in their family. He's a human. He's a human. He's not my family. Right? That's, that's the, to me, it's one of the most fascinating things is the, rom the, the, the romance of mafia. In, in the, in, you know, uh, uh, Mario Puzo, who wrote The Godfather, s started in American cinema, in, and now in the whole world, but in American cinema in 19, uh, what is that, I guess it was the 70s. It was, it was in the 70s that this, that a whole genre of movies and stories come, came out which romanticized the mafia. So when you see a mafia movie, on the one hand you go, oh gosh, it's so horrible. How could they do that? 
But on the other hand, la familia, you know, it's like a, there's something, there's something that speaks to us, right? Because it's the family. We love it. It's the family. It makes, there's something beautiful about Don Corleone. You know, he cares about his family. He cares about his brothers and his wife and his children, right? We identify with that. It's a very human, um, it touches a chord with us that my family is everything and everyone else, they can burn in hell. <laughs> Right? So it's a much more sophisticated way of looking at reality in the Torah, which says, no, 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 it's not just families, <laughs> there's also humanity. And when you kill a human being, that's murder. It doesn't matter if he's not your family, it's murder. And, and it's punishable by execution even, right? Okay, now, to get back to this, uh, the social dimension of it, right? The corresponding taboo restriction prohibits members of the same token clan from marrying or having sexual intercourse with each other. Here we have the notorious and mysterious correlate of totemism, exogamy. The correlate of totemism. On the one hand, we have a worship of an ancestor and of a totem that we're all devoted to by, and we're all related to by blood. On the other hand, these are the two, the two mitzvot, the two big mitzvot of totemism. On the one hand, to worship and to respect and to love and to take care of the totem. On the other hand, the taboo against incest. Incest in the broadest sense of the word. It's not just my sister and my mother and my daughter. It's my clan. Exogamy means that if I marry or if I have sex with anyone, any woman in my clan, that's incest. That's incest. And it's, and it's punishable by, by, by execution, actually. It's a very serious crime. Now, you can question is for Freud, <laughs> why, are these two, why are these the two pillars? What's the connection between one and the other? Now, I, wanna, I have to jump back. Freud says here, I've discussed incest before, so we should look at it just briefly on page four to six in the first essay, at the very top of page four. In almost every place where we find totems, we also find a law against persons of the same totem having sexual relations with one another and consequently against their marrying. This is exogamy, an institution related to totemism. I'll jump down just to the bottom paragraph. The violation of the prohibition is not left to what might be called automatic punishment of guilty parties, as in a case of other totem prohibitions, such as against killing a totem animal. It is avenged in the most energetic fashion by the whole clan, as though it were a question of averting some danger that threatened the whole community or some guilt that was pressing upon it. In Australia, the regular penalty for sexual intercourse with a person of a forbidden clan is death. It matters not whether the woman be of the same local group or has been captured in war from another tribe. A man of the wrong clan who uses her as his wife is hunted down and killed by his clansmen, and so is the woman. Though in some cases, if, if they succeed in eluding capture for a certain time, the offense may be contoned. And then he gives an example. He says, where the man is killed, but the woman is beaten. In other words, if I am a kangaroo, and I have, and I find a woman of the tri of, uh, I have sex with a fellow kangaroo woman. So I'm, I for sure am hunted down and killed. That's, that's my punishment for having sex with a kangaroo. The woman uh, sometimes is killed, but sometimes she's only beaten almost to the point of death. But she's allowed to live. Why? Because it's assumed that a man, it's actually very feminist, right? A man probably took advantage of her. So that as a man, I deserve death. As a woman, she doesn't deserve death because she was probably taken advantage of. So, but she participated in it, so she has to be beaten. Okay, that's, so it's capital punishment. Capital punishment for uh, sexual relations with any woman in my clan. What does that mean? That means what happens in a, in a clan when I want to get married. Exogamy. Exogamy means that when I come to a certain age and I say to my father, you know, Tati, I want to get married. So he says, okay, now, now go to the clan of the peacocks and find a woman who's a peacock to marry. Because obviously you can't marry a kangaroo, you're a kangaroo. So in, in this ancient world, in this ancient primitive setup, um, 
marriage always means marrying outside of one's clan. You never marry inside the clan. It, to marry inside the clan is incest. To us it sounds a little bit funny, it sounds the opposite, right? Because we think in terms of, oh, I'm Jewish, I have to marry a Jewish woman. I'm not going to marry a non-Jewish woman, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but they say, Dafka, it's the opposite. If you're Jewish, you shouldn't marry a Jewish woman. Right? If you marry, because it's not Judaism, it's not, we're not thinking in those terms, we're thinking in terms of tribes. If you belong to the tribe of Yehuda, you should go marry somebody from the tribe of Zvulun. You don't marry a woman from the tribe of Yehuda. That's incest. You're marrying a sister. You shouldn't marry a sister. It's a very strange because it means that uh, I was thinking about this when I read this yesterday that uh, actually the total is some animal and animals are, doesn't have problem to have sex with the brother or the sister. Of course not. And so human very early should recognize that there is a really serious genetic problem with the why? Ah, because of that, actually Freud points out, he says that that's a, that's a myth. That's a medical myth. In other words, um, and from what I've seen, it is a myth. We, we say that, oh, if you marry your sister, you're going to have gen genetic issues, whatever. It, it, there's no... The, the only thing that you can say, that we, uh, apparently, is that if the gene pool is small, then it's true, there, are gene there are, is a higher likelihood of genetic, uh, you know, inheriting bad ge genetic combinations. But it doesn't mean sister, it means gene pool. In other words, if I live in a small Hasidic community, and I marry somebody in my community, you know, of, of a few hundred people, it's like I'm marrying a sister. It's a gene pool. You know what I mean by gene pool? Yeah, it's the genetic. So it's not. It's not specifically that she's my sister. That doesn't matter so much. This, yeah, yeah. That's a myth. Freud points out. He says that is a myth that comes from the incest taboo. It's not the other way around. Yeah. Oh, the, oh, really? With the same surname? Oh, so they treat the surnames like a, it's like a uh, totem. Yes, exactly. And uh, they have only 286 different types of surnames. So it's an actual problem. Especially that... Well, but that's, but that, why? Then you have 285 options. Uh, no, because the distribution is uh, quite uh, unbalanced. You, if you look at, if you have a chance uh, to look at, I won't look at it now because it's a little bit complex, but... If you look at this chart over here, the little mathematical chart, you'll see how, how he explains that it's much more restrictive than that even. That it's not even, uh, you know, in a situation where you have here, he has 12 clans, so you would think that I can marry 11 clans. It's actually not true. It's actually much, much more narrow uh, because of different combinations. So yeah, it's restrictive. It's for sure restrictive. But anyway, look, we have to be careful when we we have to get, be careful to, when we discuss these things, to get rid of our assumptions. Uh, one very powerful assumption that we always have, when we read this, also when we, I, when we read the Torah, for example, I was discussing this just uh, the other day, when we, uh, as, yesterday uh, we had a Fabrengen and I was discussing um, polygamy, according to the Torah, a man can have more than one wife and so on. We have, tend to have a very romantic Western European concept of marriage, if you know what I mean. We, we think that, you know, why would I get married a woman? Well, because she's the love of my life, and she's so beautiful, and we're, so, we're soulmates, and we're, so, we're star-crossed lovers, right? That's a very narrow historical concept of marriage. You know, these people had no romance. The idea of romance is a very late, very narrow European concept. You know, to marry a woman back then is like buying a horse. You know, like check her, check her teeth. Does she have all her teeth? You know, check her feet. Does she, does she have all her toenails? Okay, she's a wife. What does it matter? You know, we, the, a wife is some, a woman that can have children. That's it. It's not a, you know, or a husband. 
husband is not, uh, doesn't have to be the love of my life. A husband is a, an arrangement, an arrangement to build a family. Yeah, yeah. The only thing, you know, even, I think the truth is that we know that too, even in, in our romantic society. It's, it, romance is one of the worst myths, I believe, of, of, that we have to struggle with. It's, it's one of the most destructive mythologies. First of all, it, it, the word tells you what it is. It's a Roman myth. It's a Roman concept, Greek and Roman concept of love. Um, and there's so much unhappiness in our world, in our European world, because of the idea of romance. There's so, so much divorce, so many stupid relationships that people get into because they have this idea that you know, if it's not this, no, it can't be a marriage, right? 200 years ago, people, first, especially in the shtetl, people didn't think like that. If you, you know, a beautiful example of this is Fiddler on the Roof. You know, when they have the song, do you love me, right? Do I love you? I, mean, I love you. We've been married for 25 years. I, I, I met you on the day, I, I met you on our marriage day. I never, do I love you, right? And then, and then the song is, it's actually a very beautiful song. She, she, you know, the song is, do I love you? I don't know. I said, but you know, I've been 25 years, I've, been, I've raised your children, I, I cook for you. I, you know, 25 years, we spent so much time together. So I must, it must mean that I love you. And he says, yeah, you know, you know what? Yeah, 25 years. In other words, the, the, the song is telling you, Jew, the real Jewish concept of love is, love is not beauty, it's not intelligence, it's not emotional compatibility. Love is only one thing, time. That's it. 25 years of marriage. If you've stuck it out, you love each other. It shows you love each other. Everything else is shtuyot. Yeah. <laughs> From the Torah, yeah. Yaakov Avinu and Rachel. <laughs> Yaakov Avinu and Rachel is a very good example of why it's not, why it, it, romance fails. It's a failed relationship. You already have this here. Yeah, but he, first of all, we impose a lot. How do we know he had romantic feelings? Because when he saw her, he kissed her, and she was beautiful, and that's it, right? Okay, that's it. Usually there's more to that than romance, but even let's assume that... 40 years. Yeah, he did. And, and what happened at the end? Was he happily married to Rachel? Not, not nearly, not, not clearly. You see that, he, is, that, that he, 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 is, he has more struggles with Rachel than he has with Leah. She, with Ra Rachel comes up to Yaakov because she sees her, her sister is getting pregnant. Her sister has four boys and Rachel is still having no children. And Rachel starts yelling at him. She says, you, you, you love her more than me because she, she's getting pregnant. Why am I not getting pregnant? You're, what are you doing to her? You, you love, clearly love her more. And he says to her, what am I, God? He says, literally, am I God? Am I deciding? What's this? I'm you know, he, he has a very hard time with this woman who is the love of his life. With Leah, he doesn't have such a hard time. <laughs> There's no mention of it anyway, right? And, and in the end, when, when he dies, who is he buried with in Machpelah? <coughs> He's buried with Leah, not with Rachel. Rachel has her own place. Because she died on the way. She died on the way, but it's a, for, I think by Jews, it's a sign of something, right? I'm just saying, it's not so clear even you know, in the romantic relationships of the Torah, that, that romance is a good thing. In fact, it suggests the opposite. Another very good example is David and Bathsheba. Wow, a big romance, David and, you know, David and Bathsheba. It was a total disaster, a disaster. You know, a murder is involved. They got divorced in the end. You know, when, she, when, David, is, when David and Melech is old, she has to come to him and beg him to make Shlomo the successor you know, and, and he's like, leave me alone. You know, he's like, she, old lady, you know, I'm not, you're not the love of my life anymore. So there's no, the Torah has no indication that romance is, 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 the, is the model of a good marriage. Not at all. The, the, few, the few examples where there is seemingly romance are typically examples of, of, of failed relationships or of problematic relationships, let's say. Oh, that's full of problems that were met marriage. <laughs> yeah. But that, but you're right. But that you're right. But that's also a good example of, of also a bad relation because because she, she tells her husband, "I can't have children. Sleep with this woman." 
he, he doesn't want to sleep with this woman. <laughs> so he, he does it, right? He has a son, the son grows up, and then she says, kick them out, kick them out. He says, what do you mean kick them out? This is my son, I can't kick out my own son. And this is, I'm not gonna kick anybody out. And, and she says, she says, you kick them out. You, she, she he, he refuses. He absolutely categorically refuses to listen to his wife. And she says, Hashem will judge between you and, you and me. And it's only because Hashem, by Nevoah, tells Avram, he says, Shema Bekola, listen, listen to her. He wouldn't do it by himself. He's not, he's not so romantic. He's not afraid of Sarah. He's afraid of God. So when God says, she's right, then Avram says, fine. If you say she's right, I'll do it. But I don't think she's right. Right, so I'm not, saying, I'm not saying Avram and Sarah didn't have a good relationship. I think they did. But I'm saying it's not, a, it's not a romantic relationship and it's not a relationship without problems. It's a deeply problematic relationship. Um, and it's, okay, why, why do we get off on this tangent? The, 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 when we're talking here about, about uh, people marrying outside of their clan, it's not such a big, I assume it's not such a big deal. You go to the next clan, any available women, yes, here's five, she's fine. Anyway, so he, in this paragraph here, uh, they say, well, may, they, when they're at different theories about why, why is there an incest taboo? So one, one, uh, one idea is, well, it's disgusting. It's gross. It's just that naturally, when I look at my sister, uh, uh, I don't want to have I don't want sex with my sister. That's gross, right? <laughs> or my mother, ugh, that's so disgusting, right? So he says, now Fraser says, it's not easy to see why any deep human instinct should, be, should need to be reinforced by law. There's no law commanding men to eat and drink or forbidding men to put their hands in the fire, right? There's no halakha which says, thou shalt not put thy hand in the fire. Why? Because if I put my hand in the fire, I don't, I'm an idiot. I, I'm sick and I need a psychiatrist. I don't need Moshe Rabbeinu to tell, to tell me, don't put your hand in the fire. Right? It's natural. I, I avoid it. And yet, I do need a law which says don't marry your sister. Which means what? Which means it's not disgusting. If I, if there was, if, if I naturally avoided it, I wouldn't need a taboo. I only need a taboo because I have a desire of some sort. Of some sort. Now, in our, of course, in our sophisticated uh, European uh, you know, uh, civilization, we've come to think of certain things as disgusting. But we can see how easy it is to overcome that if there's a social, uh, sh if there's a s shift in social uh, pr uh, parameters. So for example, you know, a Jew, a, a religious Jew will, will say, Chazer, here's a bacon sandwich, Chazer, gross, or, or a Muslim, right? But, but then, you know, or shrimp, lobster, octopus, like, disgusting. I would never eat an octopus. But if you have the opportunity and you have enough people, you know, friends who eat octopus and, you know, you're in a, somewhere and you're not a particularly religious person, so you'll try a piece of octopus. Oh, it's delicious. Maybe I'll have an octopus again, right? Or another example I find, if, to me, is fascinating, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the world of Hollywood. Um, when I was a boy, the, the idea of showing t two men kissing in a movie was completely unheard of, right? You would say, oh, they're gay, but you wouldn't see a love scene between two men. Today, almost every show on Netflix, you'll see some kind of sex scene between two men, right? And, and, and I have to say, I mean, I watch, you know, I'm, a, I'm supposedly a Haredi. I'm not such a good Haredi, but I do watch uh, movies and videos. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm, I'm shocked at, my, at myself that initially when I would see it, I'd be like, oh, God, I can't look at that. It's gross, right? But now it doesn't bother me anymore. If I see a video and there's a kissing scene between two men, whatever, it doesn't, doesn't disgust me. So you see that human emotions shift. We're very plastic, we're much more plastic than we think. And at any given time, you might think that something is unnatural, but it's only because your taboos are so deeply ingrained that it feels wrong, but you can overcome it. And what Freud is saying is that the incest taboo, the way, the way we feel about it, 
is very artificial. That, that primitive human beings do not feel so disgusted by it. It's actually quite natural. It's, it's very normal to want to have sex with your mother or your, or your sister or your daughter. But it's, 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 why not? You, you know, it's actually it's a very funny thing. I don't want to get into it because it's very complicated, I find. But in the Torah, it says, uh, ah, where is it? I forget. It. I think it's Bamid Bar, but I don't remember where the Pasuk is. It says, there's one line. There's, there's also a famous list in Vaikra Yudchet, which we see on Yom Kippur, which gives a list of sexual prohibitions. as Homosexuality is one of them. You know, your mother, your daughter, and so on, right? And, uh, a list of whatever, all kinds. Of, but there's another place, independently of that, where it says, a man should not sleep with his sister. Why? Chesed he. And the, and the, and the Farshim are like, what? What? What did you say? This is not a pirush. It says the Torah. It says the Torah clearly. It's a chesed. Don't sleep with your sister. It's chesed. Isn't the chesed a good thing? Aren't there chesedim who are good? I thought chesed was good, but the Torah says, you know, it's a chesed, but it's not a good chesed. In other words, even something. Which I had a rabbi in Toronto who used to say, this is the real the real problem with incest. It's not that it's bad, it's that it's too good. It's too good for us. And even, even as, uh, Rashi and the Sforno, Ovadia Sforno explains, he gives examples, he's uh, from Moshe Rabbeinu, that in Moshe Rabbeinu's family there was quite a bit of incest. Yocheved, uh, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, um, uh, grandmother, Yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, not sister, uh, Amram, his father, Amram is Moshe Rabbeinu's father, he married Yocheved, who was his aunt. His own aunt, right? And they say, there's, you know, was that, that, that's not allowed. It's, it's assume do raita now, right? You can't, a man can't marry his aunt, right? Or Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu marrying two sisters, right? The, the, the raita, a man is not allowed to do that. But, but, but the Sforno says, when people are on a certain uh, spiritual level, it's actually even better. And that's what chesed who means. That, that, that in a sense, if we were truly spiritual, this is a Jewish take on it. It's not what Freud is talking about, but I just want, I want to make the comparison that, that in a sense, it could be that in, incest is too good, as it were, from the standpoint of the Torah. What does that mean, too good? It means that your sister, your sister is somebody, assuming you have a good relationship with your sister, it's somebody you grew up with, somebody you love, somebody who loves you, Somebody you would never abuse and, you know, and, and hurt. Somebody you want to take care of. Somebody who understands you very well. Somebody you understand very well. Why wouldn't you want to marry your sister? It's the best option. It's the best idea. And that's why, you know, uh, or, or your mother. That's why when you ask a little boy or a little girl, you ask a little girl, who do you want to marry? I want to marry Abba. What's the Shiloh? Of course I want to marry my father. Why would I want to marry anybody else? I want to marry a stranger. What am I, stupid? I don't know. What do I know from me? He's an idiot next door. My neighbor, my father, my, my Abba. My Abba loves me. I love my Abba. He takes care of me. Of course he's the best husband. Why wouldn't I marry my father? And the same thing with a boy. I want to marry my mother. What's, what's the question even? At least a sister. If not that, when I was a boy, I wanted to marry my cousin. She's my family. Why wouldn't I marry my sister? It doesn't make any sense for me to marry anybody else. Right? So there's an emotionally... It actually makes a lot of sense, the incest, to have incest. And that's why, that, that's precisely why there has to be a taboo, as it were. We'll well, Freud will give us his theory. We're still not near the, the explanation of why. But Freud would like to give an explanation for how did this taboo, a universal taboo, come about? And most importantly, how is it related to totemism? Because it, it doesn't, it seems like it's a they're very straight, two very different types of things. How are they connected? Now Freud says like this, on page 125, he begins his own theory. He offers several theories which he rejects for different reasons. And then he offers his own theory. Now, as I mentioned, uh, or maybe I didn't mention, um, his theory is very much a speculation. He knows, he's not, he, he's not lying, he's not, he's not pretending that he knows actually what happened. Nobody knows what happened because, because we're talking about prehistory. This is prehistoric 
events. Prehistoric, by definition, by definition means nobody knows. How can we know? It's only based on evidence that we do have that we can create by our imagination a reconstruction. We can reconstruct what might have happened. And that's why it's called a theory. But there is no clear proof of this theory. There cannot be. And, and people have argued, different anthropologists have disputed uh, this theory of Freud's. And Freud would have been happy to see evidence that, that shows that he's wrong because he's a scientist. Every scientist is happy. He might not be happy because, you know, for ego reasons, but if a person is a true scientist, and somebody shows evidence that, that to the contrary, so they'll change their mind. They'll say, you're okay, I, I didn't know that. That's good. I'm glad you showed me. Fine. But given the information that Freud had uh, based on people like this, on, on, on George Fraser um, and other ethnologists and anthropologists, he said, look, based on that information on the one hand, and based more importantly for Freud, on the information that he himself has as a physician, as a, as a psycho psychologist, he says, I have the following theory. So on page 25, he starts like this. He says, I want to get, begin my theory with something that he finds in Charles Darwin. Darwin represents uh, one of the great revolutions in, in Western thought after uh, Copernicus, for example. Uh, the Copernican revolution showed that the, the Earth revolves around the sun rather than the other way around. And Darwin showed that we, that, that the species are not original, but we have origins to our species. And Darwin was, was a real, a very serious scientist. He's this a guy who traveled, traveled the world and, and watched animals very closely um, and, and drew his conclusions. Now Darwin says that from his knowledge of gorillas and his observation and his readings about studies of gorillas, um, it's possible to draw a parallel with early human civilization, uh, human, uh, not civilization, but human uh, society, which is totemic society, namely, he says, when you look at gorillas, gorillas typically live in a horde, a horde we don't use the word in today's English so much. Uh, we speak of, uh, of uh, you know, the Mongol hordes and things like that, of armies. But a horde here just means a small collection of, uh, of animals, like, like a clan. So we're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40 gorillas living together. And in a horde of gorillas, according to Darwin's observations, what happens is that the pater familias, the, the, the father gorilla, has a monopoly, uh, has a sexual monopoly on all the females. He's, he's not, a gorilla is, does not observe incest taboos. A gorilla is an animal. And a gorilla says, number one, I'm an animal, I want to have sex whenever I please. And number two, I want a monopoly. Why? I mean, maybe we could use Dawkins' uh, first uh, book, uh, famous book, The Selfish Gene, right? Uh, uh, Dawkins was famous for writing a genetic book which said that uh, we're all driven by a genetic code that seeks to reproduce itself, um, you know, for, to, to, per to perpetuate itself. So he called it the selfish gene. So I, as, as, as you know, gorilla, Michael the gorilla, I would like to propagate my genetic code. So that means I have to dominate all the women, all the female gorillas. Which means, of course, whatever female gorilla happened to be my first wife. But, but a gorilla will have more than one wife. And a gorilla will have daughters. So he'll, he'll, he'll have sex with his uh, female daughters also. And he will not only have sex with his daughters, he will, he will, he will punish the sons that try to have sex with the daughters or with the mother. Because remember, these are animals. Animals have no, right? They don't, they, they don't care. Uh, they don't make no, no differentiations. 
Freud says, and Darwin, sorry, Darwin says, it's very possible that in the earliest phase of human history, this, so this would be the phase going into totemism. In other words, totemism, the totemic society, is, a, is built upon this early gorilla-like <coughs> horde. So this early, early human, in, er, human history, you have a her, an early human father who monopolizes on the females and, um, tell, uh, and, and tells the sons to stay away from the females. Now, what happens in this primordial story? At some point, the young males uh, get angry and realize that, that they have become quite strong physically and realize that the father is getting old, right? He, the father's becoming old and weak and they're now in the prime of their life and they are brothers and they can work together. So they come up with a very simple plan. Let's kill the father and then we can have access to the mother and the sister gorillas or, or, or humans, right? So this, this then, this is the first, in a way, I think according to Freud would say, this is the first truly human act. The first thing that defines humanity is that the sons kill the father. Before that, they're not really human, they're, they're more like gorillas, they behave like gorillas. But the first human action is to kill the father in order to have sex with the mother and the, and the sisters. Of course, you, I'm sure you recognize this. This is what Freud calls the Oedipal complex, the Oedipus complex. Why did Freud, why did Freud have this theory? He says, explicit, he says, I have studied children. I've had neurotic patients. I have seen in psychiatric uh, cases that people who, uh, who suffer from different neuroses, certain male. It's interesting, we have to talk about this. Why is it male? It's, it's, the Oedipal complex is, a, is, the fe is the feelings that a man has towards his mother and his father, not a woman. It's a different situation when we're talking about a girl and her father. Right? For him, it's much more primordial. The, the, the case of the male is much more primordial. That, that the, the, uh, he, he, has, he had cases where, where certain men regress, whether it's in hypnosis, in, in, in discussion, whatever, regress and, and reveal that as boys, as little boys, they had a fascination with their mother and a resentment of their father. And he even admits, he's very honest, he says, I also was one of those boys. He says, when I was a little boy, I was attached to my mother. He's a, good, he's a good Jewish boy. What's a Jewish boy? He's a mama's boy. Every Jewish boy is a mama's boy, right? He's, a, he's attached to his mother. And he says, and because of that, I had a certain uh, resentment of my father. Now, Freud gives this, of course, a very sexual interpretation. And that's why people get upset with it. They say, oh, well, how can you say a little boy, two years old, five years old, wants to have sex with his mother? That's ridiculous. Maybe that's going too far, maybe. But if you think about it, if you, if you leave out the sexual element, per se, in other words, a four-year-old boy doesn't really understand what sex is. He's not a, he's not a teenager. He doesn't know sex in the way that a 14, 15-year-old boy knows. He doesn't have, his body is not built for it. We're talking about the sexual feelings that have, do not have a corresponding sexual body, if you, if you know what I mean, right? Like, uh, you know, adolescent boys are typically very dangerous. You think, or they can be, they can be quite dangerous. Uh, in, in ga gangs and things like that. Why? Because an adolescent boy, if he's, had a, if he's had a sad childhood, this is somebody who his mind, his, his mentality is still a boy. 
but his body is now man. And there's a, there's a dissonance between those two things. What is it? So long as his body was the body of a boy, it was okay. He wasn't so destructive. He could be a bad boy. He could do bad boy things. He could light this on fire. He could get into a fight, whatever. But now he has testosterone going through his body. He has, he has powerful muscles, but his brain is still a boy. So this is, this is a, he, he's a very dangerous creature. When he becomes a man, when his brain becomes a man's brain, then it's okay because a man knows how to control himself. A boy doesn't know how to control himself. So you have an uncontrolled brain with a very powerful body, right? That's, that's quite dangerous. Uh, when, when, and, and of course it's, 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 it's dangerous when it comes to all the typical bad adolescent behavior. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? All the typical things that bad, that bad boys do when they're, when they're adolescents. Um, now, when, when Freud is talking about a boy who's only five, four, three years old, he's not an, even an adolescent yet. He doesn't have a, a man's body yet. He's a little boy. So when he says that he has sexual feelings towards his mother, he doesn't necessarily mean he, has, he literally wants to put his penis in his mother's vagina. The boy's not even thinking of those things. Does not, he doesn't have that type of body yet. But it means that his emotions, when he sees his mother, are erotic, romantic emotions. He feels very pulled towards his mother, and he's angry because he sees that his mother pays attention to his father in a, in a special way that he's not getting. And he sees that his father is able to have, can demand that attention from his mother. So he becomes, you know, very, very, he, he, he becomes resentful. This, this, in a boy, is the, is the seed of the Oedipal complex, and Freud takes that psychological phenomenon and says, we can look at early human society and say, back then, they acted on it. When they became adolescents, they said, we're killing the old bugger. We're going to kill him, or we're going to have sex with the, with the mother. That's the first part of the story. We're gonna, I'm going to stop here today, because we have to, uh, and tomorrow we'll continue this story, but... Just the fa phase one. Yeah, let's take a, take a few questions. Yeah. Affection. Yeah. Affection can exist without sexuality. Affection, sure. Yeah. So, in other words, the small boy can have both affection from his mother, but it's not sexuality. Uh, you can argue that it's sexuality quite often. Yeah. But I'm not sure if I know the fact. Yeah, he, he, no, he called, Freud is also careful to distinguish infantile sexuality for mature sexuality. So he's not stupid. He knows, you know, even a little boy or a girl who masturbates, it's not the same as a, as a, as a 15 year old who masturbates. But they don't, a little boy who's playing with his little penis is not thinking, oh, I'm gonna orgasm and this and that. He's thinking, oh, this feels good. It's like a little tickly feeling and he likes it, right? It's not the same thing. It's not, you know what I'm saying? So, so in a way, because he's playing with his penis, it's masturbation, but you can't say the masturbation of a three-year-old is the same as the masturbation of a thirty-year-old. It's not the same thing. Or a little girl, you know, a little girl rubbing herself against the couch. It's not the same thing. It's not the same phenomenon, right? And, um, okay, I'll take, I'll take this after. Yeah. So the, the important thing is, you're right. Is is the is the element of affection? Is that? Uh, and by the way. What is, what is mature eroticism is also mostly affection, in a way, right? I mean, there is the biological aspect of sex, but most of us, most mature human beings are not satisfied with biological sex. You don't just want to orgasm. You want to have intimacy. You want to be intimate, physically intimate, right? What is that? That's what you have when you're three years old. It's no different. When I want my wife to hug me, What's the difference between that? When I was three years old and I wanted my mother to hug me, it's also hugging. When I'm on my mother's breast, right? what is that? There's a, there's a connection, a deep intimacy with, with, uh, with, with the mother or, or whatever, right? Other thoughts or questions on this? Okay, maybe I'll... It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, yeah? It's difficult... Yeah, it's not natural to discuss these things. Yeah, yeah, because you know why? You know why it's embarrassing, right? It's, 
Freud, Freud says the reason it's embarrassing is, is precisely, this is precisely the problem. The problem is that we have the, we've built up these taboos around this and we're scared. And in a way we should be scared. We should be scared because these are it's a dangerous topic. It's a, it's a topic that touches on things where, where we know we're not quite in control. We know that, we, that when it comes to romance and sex, all of us become weak. Even though in my mind, I don't want, you know, I tell myself, that's, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's, that's not for me. And yet when the opportunity arises, suddenly I'm doing it. Why? Why did you do that? Because it's such a weak, it's the weakest point in our brain. The connection with Moshe Rabbeinu is, not, is nowhere near clear yet, right? But this is the uh, schema, the psychological, anthropological schema that Freud develops uh, in this book, which then will show up in his interpretation of the Torah. Because he wants to show how in the Torah, of course, a similar thing is happening. And, and we'll see how, and if, and, 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 and if he's right, that means that you know, the whole of our civilization is built on this, on this very weak foundation which, which is the ultimate, the ultimate cause of so much of our unhappiness, of, uh, of civiliza civilizational unhappiness. Mm -hmm.